Welcome to the Hanu Health Podcast, where our mission is to help you to breathe better and stress less. On this show, we discuss a variety of topics and provide practical suggestions for improving health and well-being. However, none of the education, tips, and tricks provided should be taken as medical advice. Your medical doctor is your best bet if you have medical questions. Also, on this podcast, we interview numerous guests from diverse backgrounds, interests, and may carry some unique ideas. Hanu Health as a company does not endorse all all statements provided by guests or condone all suggestions or protocols discussed. We just like hearing about cool people doing rad and new things. So sit back, relax, breathe, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Hanu Health Podcast. I'm a little lonely today. That's right, it's just me. I'm all by my lonesome. Actually, it's kind of nice because I can operate things on my own time, kind of go at my own pace, say whatever I want to say. You know, it works out in my favor. Now, but seriously, welcome back. This is a solo episode of the Hanu Health Podcast. This is actually going to be a bit of a recurring theme that we do every once in a while. That's going to be myself talking about topics that I love, which is really just the human stress response and heart rate variability. So I'm actually talking today about heart rate variability, but in a Q&A format. So if you follow us on Instagram, and here's my shameless plug, at Hanu Health or at Dr. J. Wiles, but more specifically, at Hanu Health, periodically you're going to see that we end up uh, putting out kind of a, a request. And the request will be that you ask us any and every question that you may have about heart rate variability, about the human stress response, about HRV biofeedback or training, anything as it relates to the uh, Hanu Health ecosystem, the global stress resiliency system that we're developing or maybe have developed by the time you listen to this. So today is, again, going to be all about Q&A for heart rate variability. And if you go on and ask us a question, um, and you can actually submit the question as well to podcast at hanuhealth.com. If you submit us a question and we ask, or I guess respond to that question here on this podcast, then we're going to send you an amazing Hanu Health goodie package. So what does that goodie package look like? Well, it's a couple of Hanu Health logo stress balls, you know, for those times when you just really need to get the forearm forearm workout going, relieve a little bit of stress that way. It's actually some pretty good science behind that. Then we also have the Hanu Health uh, aluminum BPA-free bottle, which is a really cool snazzy bottle with our logo on it. A couple of die cut stickers that you can throw on the car, you know, your back of your laptop or, you know, on your, you know, cell phone, whatever you want to put those are really, really sharp. And then the last things that we give away are a copy of our co-host Patrick McCune's book, Atomic Focus, which not only do we give you that book, which is amazing on everything, cognition, focus, stress, resiliency through breath work, but we also provide... Uh, uh, it, it signed. Patrick signs it for you. So you know you want to be able to show that goodie off to all your health and wellness and biohacking friends. So we'll give you that. And then the last goodie is that we give you a whole pack of myotape. I've got one in my hand right now. So if you hear that that beautiful crinkling, that's a pack of myotape that could be yours if you write us a review or if you submit us a question. So this myotape, you're, man, it's it's amazing because with most mouth tape, you have to place it directly over your lips in order to seal your lips shut while you're sleeping or exercising, whatever kind of you know way you're using it. And the problem is, is that in the middle of the night, if you need to talk to you know your significant other or your kids, as in my case, like you have to pull it off, and then you know you waste that tape. You have to go take the time to you know get another one. You know, there's some other brands that do that as well. Whereas Myotape goes around the lips and provides kind of a gentle pull of the lips together, so that whenever you want to talk to your family or to your friends or whoever else is sleeping over, and you're wearing mouth tape because you know you're going to do it during you know friend sleepovers as well then you have the ability just to be able to talk and then dispose of it in the morning. So you just use one per night. And this packet, I can't remember, it doesn't say on the packet how many is in here, but it's a lot. It's like, I think it lasts like three months, um, which is incredible. So we'll send you a supply of myotape as well. So again, all you got to do is either do one of two things. Provide us with a review that we'll read on the Q&A episodes uh, on on, uh, Apple Podcasts. Or the other thing that you can do is... uh, submit a question. And if we 
answer your question here on the HRV Q and A's, uh, and you hear your name and your question called out, you'll just email us podcast at hanuhealth.com with your name, the question that you asked, your address, and then we'll send you over this Hanu Health goodie package. All right. With that said, let's jump in to the Hanu Health Q and A HRV episode. So if you are um, new to us, if this is your first time tuning into this episode, this podcast is uh, from my company. I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Hanu Health, where our goal and our mission is to increase self-awareness of the human stress response, and then to create a global operating system to be able to better self-regulate. And we utilize many different proxies, but the main one that we use is something called heart rate variability, or HRV. Today, I'm going to explain what HRV is, but not in great detail. Um, we'll do some more detailed podcasts on HRV. I, I did one um, about a year or so ago with Ben Greenfield on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. We'll link that one in the show notes. It can be found at hanuhealth.com slash podcast. And that is kind of a you know deep dive, all in kind of... Uh, just really strong exploration of like all things HRV. And so I would really encourage you to listen to that one. It's like two hours long that kind of just opens up the whole can of what HRV is and then how to utilize it. But today I'm just going to give kind of a brief overview because I'm going to be answering questions about HRV. So I probably should set the stage for those who don't know what HRV is. Uh, but again, back to the kind of this podcast, like <laughs> our goal and our intent is to really help you to optimize your ability uh, to deal with stress, to create this insanely strong level of fortitude within your nervous system so that when the inevitable mountain lion jumps around the corner, and again, the mountain lion nowadays can be things like finances or you know social isolation due to COVID-19 or work or family or whatever it may be, we want to be able to have such a strong, resilient level of fortitude within our nervous system to not fully implode. And the reason that we fully implode is because a lot of times we keep the gas pedal down all the time, 24-7, 365. When I say gas pedal, that's my uh, analogy for our sympathetic nervous system. That is the fight or flight response system that's found within the uh, branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is uh, also a part of our peripheral nervous system. It has a direct link to our central nervous system or our brain and spinal cord. And this is a relay system. It's a relay system for safety and protection, but it's also a means of energy reserve and conservation and energy expenditure. So you can think about energy expenditure as being linked with our sympathetic nervous system and energy reservation or conservation with our parasympathetic nervous system, which is also our rest, digest, relax, um, relaxation branch of the autonomic nervous system. And so, again, we want to utilize kind of our platform, both in the Hanu Health podcast, but also to, um, you know, from our, our, our health technology to be able to help people to become more aware of the effects of stress. Also, to what are are the you know precipitants or antecedents of that stress experience um, because a lot of us just aren't familiar with it we haven't identified like what are those key things that are truly causing us stress and anxiety and leading to just kind of a very low level of health and wellness and certainly nothing even you know remotely close to what we would consider health optimization our hope and our goal is that you can first become more self-aware of how stress impacts you and what causes stress. What is the root cause of stress for you? Which can be so many different things, you know, from, you know, the things that you put into your body or do not put into your body, uh, your relationships, um, it can be your work, it can be finances, uh, it could be the way you're breathing, it can be all of these different things. So we really like to make sure that people kind of take a deep dive um, and really, you know, look inward to see, like, what are those things and outward, I would say too, but look to see what are those things that are truly causing stress? What are those things that are truly impacting your overall sense of mood and well-being and your ability to connect and love and care and be close to others uh, and then just thrive in life, whether it be in work uh, or it be in athletics and whatever it may be, like identifying kind of those key things uh, is again, self-awareness and then self-regulation. 
without self-regulation, self-awareness um, is only just a really small aspect. It ends up being just kind of like data. No, it's kind of like HRV. HRV in and of itself is just data. It's what you do with that data that really matters. It's kind of like putting on an aura ring for sleep. And then each morning you look at your sleep architecture and you know the amount of sleep and your sleep onset time and how many times you are awake. And if all you do is look at that information and you don't close the loop, then essentially that data is, is meaningless. It's meaningless. It's great information for you to have. It's interesting at best, but if it's not practical and usable, then like who cares? Why waste $300 on a device if you're not going to actually close the loop and do something about it? So it's a little tangential. I can kind of get on a soapbox. But again, I think that's just what I wanted to highlight. You know, what we do here at, at Hanu Health is that we create a fully closed loop system where you, number one, have great data and information as to kind of what you are experiencing, both objectively and subjectively in relation to stress resiliency. And then we increase your ability to self-regulate through different therapeutics. And that can be, again, so many different things. And we'll talk about that today. There was actually a question that we're going to get into today about um, are, are there other things to raise HRV? So with that said, before we get into the questions for today, let me give kind of a short primer and overview overview of what in the world this thing is that is HRV. So HRV is just shorthand, obviously, for heart rate variability. And if you do not know what heart rate variability is, I want to just take a, you know, just a few minutes. I won't go too deep into this, but uh, again, go to that podcast I did with Ben Greenfield. But I just want to take just a short, you know, few minutes to explain, you know, what heart rate variability is, because there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people think that heart rate is heart rate, uh, sorry, that heart rate variability is is heart rate. And that's not the case. Heart rate variability is derived from your heart rate. It is a biometric understanding. However, it is not the same thing as heart rate. So HRV and HR or heart rate are not the same. Let me just explain it to you really, really simply in ways, in, a, in kind of a an example that I think everybody can understand. So we all know that we can take our heart rate. We can take that through, you know, different types of wearables um, or like a chest strap, or you can just, you know, count, you put your two fingers on your carotid artery and you can count the number of beats that occur within a 10 second time frame, and then times it by six because there are obviously 60 seconds in a minute and therefore you can derive your heart rate. And so a heart rate is just an average. It's an average amount of the beats that occur per minute. So let's just utilize some simple math. So someone who puts on a chest strap or they you know, put their fingers on the carotid artery and they count the number of beats that occur in a minute, um, let's say they have a heart rate of 60. And so if they have a heart rate of 60, that means that within that minute time span, their heart beat 60 times. Now, intuitively, uh, we would just think that, okay, so if it beats 60 times in 60 seconds or one minute, then that means that their heart rate beat every one second. So every second, or in heart rate variability terms, we, we use milliseconds, so that would be 1,000 milliseconds. So every 1,000 milliseconds or every one second, the heart would beat. Now, intuitively, you're not wrong. I mean, average out, um, the time frame would be, uh, indeed, you know, one second, or it would seem that way. However, that would mean that, again, that the heart is pacing itself every one second it beats. Now, does the heart work like that? Is that how heart rate is, is derived? And the short answer is no. Let's think about heart rate. So with each heartbeat, there was always a heartbeat that came before the current heartbeat, and there will always be a heartbeat that comes after. And if we had one second in between those, then that the level of heart rate variability there, if that was one second, every, every one second you, you had a heartbeat, the amount of variability would be zero. You would have a heart rate variability of zero because that's what HRV, it's the variability of time that occurs in between successive heartbeats or adjacent heartbeats. So again, if, if, if the heartbeat that came before the current heartbeat had a one second interval of time in between it, and then your heart beats, and then um, a second later, the other heartbeat came, then that would be one second or, again, zero heart rate variability. That's not how the heart works. Actually, if we saw that, 
that's quite indicative of someone who is in some serious need of help cardiovascularly because the heart is pacing themselves. Now, you wouldn't typically see someone with a heartbeat or a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, as I'm giving in this example. Again, this is fictitious. Uh, you wouldn't see that uh, representative of, of, of someone who would have a paced heart like that, but it could happen. And that's kind of like a telltale sign that the heart and cardiovascular respiratory system is pacing itself uh, because of something seriously wrong. Here's another great example as how heart rate variability is derived. So here's one thing to think about. When you inhale, I mean, this is across the respiratory cycle. When you inhale, the heart rate is going to increase. And that's because the foot is actually going to be drawn off what's called the vagal break. So that's the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, which is responsible for modulating our relaxation response. When we actually inhale, we, or the gas pedal isn't laid down when we inhale. It's actually the brake is pulled off a little bit. And so the heart rate will increase. And if you think about it this way, what's happening here is that we are receiving a lot of oxygen that should now be delivered throughout all the tissues into the body to be utilized effectively. So we want the heart to pump faster in order to, um, in order to uh, take oxygen both to muscles in the body, but also to obviously the brain. And so because of that, uh, the, the, the vagal break is relinquished when we inhale. Heart rate increases significantly. So you can go from, let's say, a 50 up to a 70 um, within the span of the, the inhale. And as you exhale, then that's actually when we place our foot back on the brain or we press it a little bit harder than what we did when we were inhaling and the heart rate will significantly slow down. So you may have a heart rate that starts off at 50, then when you inhale it goes up to 70, and then as you exhale it goes back down to 50 or maybe even lower than that. And that change across the respiratory cycle is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia and is actually one of the most significant influencers of heart rate variability. So a lot of people will ask, so does that mean that you can extend your inhalations because that's more of a pressing of the vagal break, more engagement of the parasympathetic nervous system? And the short answer to that is yes. And guess what? The more and more you train that response, the more and more the break listens to you, the more and more you can excite or exercise control over that part of the nervous system. So I always tell people that again, like the lowest hanging fruit and the biggest influencer of changes in the nervous system and heart rate variability ability is slowing your breathing down and utilizing proper breathing mechanics. What you'll actually find is that when you slow your breathing down, if you just focus on pace, that many people actually will effectively change the mechanics just naturally. It's kind of this, this organic thing that happens, not all the time, but a lot of the times. So that's one thing that you should really watch out for. So, so is the inverse to that uh, hold true? So if we uh, increase the rate of our breathing, if we make our breathing more labored or even more shallow, will that affect heart rate variability? And the clear answer in scientific literature is absolutely. So if you are a more rapidly breathing, if you're having more shallowed or labored breathing, then what you'll see is a significant drop in overall heart rate variability and you'll see an increase in heart rate. Um, Rapid breathing is a direct signal um, to the brain and the central nervous system from your cardiorespiratory system and autonomic nervous system that you are undergoing a threat because the body almost perceives it as, oh, you must be running. There must be the mountain lion must be chasing you right now. And that may sound a little bit like hyperbole or exaggerated, but that's actually how things work. I mean, the brain hasn't evolved to understand the signal that much differently. Now, we can cognitively understand that when we're you know receiving a scathing email from our boss or you know we have trouble with finances, we, we cognitively know that the mountain lion, that there's not an, an actual mountain lion or threat to our survival or life, which it could be, I mean, technically, but, but in the moment it's not like af as if you were, you know, walking around in the mountains and a mountain lion jumped around the corner. However, the brain is not super great at identifying that. And because so like it actually will respond very similarly, um, to the, you know, scathing email as it might would to a mountain lion, just maybe on a less significant scale. It's like the gas pedal might be pushed down halfway with a scathing email instead of a full way. But if you compound that over time, day in, day out, hour after hour without sending another signal of safety and protection, then the problem is, is that you see this slew 
of deleterious effects that then come afterwards because the body and the brain uh, really don't know the difference. Um, it's under this constant state of threat um, for your survival. And in the end, it's going to do what it can to help you survive. And a lot of times that's through pacing kind of your, your heart rate in order to create some level of homeostasis to the amount of chaos that you're experiencing. Now, let me clarify to you, and hopefully that you know makes sense. I mean, there's a general rule of thumb that the more that you can raise or modulate your HRV at will, that's more sign of control of your of, of overall you know parasympathetic control, but also as well as as vagal control. Um, just because you have parasympathetic control doesn't mean you have vagal tone. Uh, very different concept. Not worth our time to get in here, but we'll cover this in, in future podcasts. Uh, but but it does mean that you have you know more control. Um, in, in a lot of people kind of and this is again kind of a takes us down a rabbit hole so I won't spend too much time on this but a lot of people believe that a higher baseline HRV is uh, indeed what we're looking for and there's a little bit of truth in that but not much Um, a higher baseline comparative to yourself not comparative normatively like if you look at the research and I'll answer this question here in just a second um, there's not a lot of research to demonstrate a need for normative comparison at least not yet I mean we'll see what happens in the future maybe Hanu Health will drive that research actually I think we will you know I'm biased of course you know remember I'm the chief scientific officer of the company Uh, One thing to keep in mind with HRV is that um, everybody gets so worried and and caught up in this idea of raising HRV, but what is HRV? Like, what are we even talking about? We're talking about a non-invasive proxy for determining stress resiliency and nervous system functioning for recovery. This has got to be clarified. And so many people, um, I think that they get caught up in this idea of, of it being a number, almost kind of like blood pressure, and it becomes gamified, which isn't bad necessarily, but it can be if you're missing the point. What I would love people to do is instead of thinking of HRV just solely as this idea of heart rate variability, it being, you know, this number in milliseconds or these frequency band domains to instead think of heart rate variability as again, kind of your ability to withstand um, and be resilient to the human stress response, your ability to control your physiology and your response to stress. And if we conceptually think of it that way, I think that that's a lot stronger storyline than us just kind of considering HRV as just kind of this health and wellness biometric, which it is, but it's also, uh, we cannot overlook, you know, kind of what's truly at the core of heart rate variability or the foundation of heart rate variability. Now, last thing I'll mention before we get into the Q&A is that there's many metrics of, of, of determining heart rate variability. And basically what happens is, is that through different algorithms um, and um, statistical calculations, heart rate uh, data and what we call inter- interval data, which is the time that occurs in between heart rate, um, these are put into these algorithms to determine uh, from research standards uh, different biometrics, um, which these different biometrics metrics of heart rate variability mean different things and have different applications. So again, it would take me, you know, four hours to get into everything I would want to get in into this, which again, like hold your breath or don't hold your breath. That wouldn't probably, now you can actually, this is a whole rabbit trail, but hold your breath. I mean, that's actually a really good thing if you do it consciously and don't pass out. Great for CO2 tolerance training. Go listen to the podcast that obviously we do with Patrick McCune, but also a great one that we did recently with uh, uh, Jacko, with David Jackson, which is great on breath holding. But anyway, uh, these metrics, again, are, are found in really all wearables, but the primary one that you really want to utilize is one called RMSSD, the root mean of successive squared differences, which is a mouthful of statistical jargon for heart rate variability. You don't need to know that equation, but basically it is our best known and most reliable short-term time domain measurement of heart rate variability. And when we say time domain measurement, that it's looking at kind of the averages of time in between interby intervals or, or the amount of variability in your heart rate uh, in, in terms of time. Now, one of the things that I love about RMSSD, again, this is the most widely studied short term. And when I say short term, I mean, it's not a 24 hour measurement and we can actually assess and take RMSSD in a two to five minute period. Five minutes is considered the gold standard for RMSSD time measurement. 
However, we can we do have research to indicate that two minutes uh, will suffice. And um, uh, my friend Marco Altini has actually done some really interesting research that's looking at even more short term, like ultra short term, like 30 seconds to a minute, uh, which indeed um, there, there's some promise to indicate that we can deduce or actually kind of extrapolate that data um, to to be more broad than you know we, we once believed. So we might even be getting down to like 30 second measurements as an accurate level of detection of HRV. So anyway, I, I like to use RMSSD. I also use a lot of bands within the frequency band domains, um, like LF or low frequency, and then high frequency. Um, again, it, it's going to take a little bit too much time to get into those, so I'm going to hold off for future podcasts. Again, go check out my podcast with Ben Greenfield, which I think is the third time I mentioned it. Go check it out, and you'll hear a little bit more about it. So with that kind of basic knowledge of heart rate variability, in play, or again, kind of the biometric, the non-invasive biometric of assessing nervous system resiliency, let's talk about um, kind of some questions that we got. So some Q&A questions. So let's go ahead now and jump into those. So this is the part of the episode where I answer your questions in the best possible way I can. And so again, I thank you for submitting them. You can go onto our Instagram at Hanu Health, onto our website, HanuHealth.com, or email us podcast at HanuHealth.com. And that will be a great way for you to ask questions on all things heart rate variability, uh, breath work and stress resiliency for Patrick and I to cover. Uh, but if you specifically have HRV questions, I'm going to answer them on these HRV Q and A's. And if I answer your question again, email us podcast at HanuHealth.com with your name and address and we'll get you out the sweet gear package. So question number one comes from Mark. So Mark asks, I'm not totally sure what HRV training is. Is it biofeedback with breath work or is it a specific type of training? I really love this question because I use that term a lot, um, HRV training. Um, I use HRV biofeedback as a term a lot as well. And so I want to kind of clarify. So again, Mark is kind of asking, like, is, is HRV training, is that biofeedback with breath work or is it a specific type of training? Uh, again, great question. So let me uh, kind of first respond to that word biofeedback because a lot of people will ask, well, what is biofeedback? Um, because it's a term that has become even more popular Popularized, I'd say within the last decade, it's been around for a while, um, for for quite some time. But really, what biofeedback is is, is a sophisticated way of utilizing your biology as feedback to training. Um, and when we say training, that can be kind of on really many different accords. Uh, that can be breathwork training, as Mark is asking about here. It can be on exercise training, or it could be on other types or variances of training. So when I talk about HRV training, uh, m most of the time, and this is not 100% of the time, but most of the time, I'm actually referring to biofeedback. Um, and, you, and when we say biofeedback um, in terms of heart rate variability biofeedback, that's utilizing different types of breathwork techniques in order to raise the amplitude of heart rate variability to create a stronger and more resilient nervous system. Now, the whole intent and idea behind heart rate variability biofeedback. And there was a great podcast I did with Dr. Leah Lagos, who's a preeminent expert in the area of biofeedback, wrote a great book called Heart, Breath, and Mind. Um, listen to that podcast. But well, in that podcast, we really discuss kind of the, the need to practice this on a daily basis in order to condition a response. So what does HRV biofeedback look like in this context? Well, HRV biofeedback is actually utilizing and leveraging technology um, that is assessing heart rate variability uh, in order to kind of train the heart rate variability as an objective response in the upward direction, so raise HRV, but probably most importantly is the ability to kind of tap into the body's um, uh, ability to uh, respond to stress, and so therefore you will reduce kind of your subjective experience, and even I would say the cognitive experience of anxiety and of stress. So this would look like you hooking yourself up to some type of either PPG or EKG monitor to look at heart rate and heart rate variability, and then utilize different paced breath work techniques in order to raise the amplitude or raise heart rate variability. Again, that uh, change in breathing by reducing kind of your, uh, changing the breath mechanics, but also reducing the pace of breathing, typically down to around 
six breaths per minute or your resonant rate or resonant frequency rate can significantly influence kind of your ability um, to, uh, to handle and be resilient to stress. So with biofeedback training, we do this um, uh, as a practice or a level of training so that we condition a response over time. And the, the idea is that the more and more you engage in self-awareness of stress, when we see heart rate variability drop and when you experience it subjectively, and the more and more you train to self-regulate your response to stress through breathing, through heart rate variability training and heart rate variability biofeedback, then the more and more uh, the, the, the nervous system, autonomic nervous system is going to send the signal to the central nervous system that that is, gonna, that is going to be kind of your natural inclination. Uh, that's going to be your natural reflex. So that when you're out and about and kind of the crap hits the fan, if you will, you're your body and your brain will automatically turn to this type of training, even or subconsciously to you because you've conditioned that response so that when you kind of come out of it and you come out of that stress response, it's not saying you will never experience stress and it will never impact you. It will. You, you can't train a resiliency to stress that doesn't have it, that, that, that allows no impact of stress on the mind and body. Like that's just an inevitable part. But the, the interesting thing about it is that you create such resiliency and fortitude that when you do come out of these uh, stress events that you might even look back and say, wow, I didn't even realize like I was pacing my breathing. I was engaging in these more heart rate variability biofeedback type coping skills and mechanisms. And then, uh, uh, and, and yeah, so the severity of the stress, the frequency of the duration of the stress are inhibited. So that's biofeedback training in, in a nutshell. Um, the more and more kind of you utilize heart rate variability as a biometric and breathing and breathwork training as a biometric, the more we can condition the response. So one thing that I'll say is that um, the, the best way to maximize biofeedback training for heart rate variability is to find your resonant rate. So when we say resonant frequency or we'll say resonant rate, um, this was actually comes from the research of a guy named Dr. Paul Lair. And what Dr. Paul Lair found is that human adults, uh, I need to clarify, you know, human because, you know, we don't want to get this mixed up with dog resonant frequency. I'm joking, uh, but <laughs> with a human uh, adult, resonant frequency rate is typically around six and a half at the highest breaths per minute down to about four and a half breaths per minute. Now, or four breaths per minute even too. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that there's a lot of variance as to why um, you know people have certain or different uh, uh, HRV resonant frequencies. This can be due to height, can due to weight, due to gender. Uh, for instance, my resonant rate is 5.0, 5.0 breaths per minute. But what this rate does and breathing at this rate does is it, again, helps us to maximize heart rate variability. Now, do you need to have, uh, do you need to know specifically your resonant rate? Not necessarily. Uh, you, it is effective to optimize HRV and stress resiliency. However, if you get your breathing down to six breaths per minute or around that ballpark, which would be like, you know, a four second inhale, six second exhale, or five, five, five inhale, five exhale, that which gets you at six breaths per minute. That's around the ballpark of where you want to be. Uh, most people will actually experience a significant increase in these heart rate variability biometrics alongside a reduction in subjective stress by getting down to that rate. If you're able to identify your rate, which just wait again, hanuhealth.com slash waitlist, this is going to be a pivotal part of our health technology is helping you to determine your HRV resonant frequency rate. So go join us, sign up, hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. Um, then that, again, is going to be kind of like, it, it's, it's the cherry on top. It's kind of the way of maximizing, of, of, of optimizing your ability to tap in to your, um, to your vagus nerve and vagal modulation. So I like resonance training as kind of my go-to. What does that mean? So for me, each morning I'll wake up. And I'll do anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes of resonant breathing at my rate. Um, what I like to do is a five second inhale, seven second exhale. And sometimes I'll throw in some breath holds there, but I'll follow a pacer that way. Now um, I'll file, follow a pacer at five breaths per minute. And that for me will maximize my heart rate variability amplitude. What are you looking for in biofeedback? Well, you're looking to see is that arm SSD value changing? Is your low frequency value significantly increasing during training? 
not during rest, but during training. We actually know um, that at the 0.1 hertz area, we call that kind of the resonant rate or the meditator's peak. If you're able to move um, your your breathing rate to align with 0.1 hertz, then that 0.1 hertz is going to actually resonate through the body. It's going to resonate through the ba- brain, which is actually very consistent. 0.1 hertz would be right there at the alpha brainwave state, at the flow state. And again, this is a very systematic way of looking at it, but we can change heart rate variability in order to change brainwave functioning. It's pretty incredible how this resonates or that resonant frequency will resonate within the cardiorespiratory system, but also too cognitively and within your neurological um, system as well in the central nervous system. So I like to do resonant breathing, look at low frequency power, raise that power within my uh, biofeedback session. And then after my session, I'll look to see, was there a change in the static baseline of my HF or high frequency baseline? So prior to training, I look at RMSSD value and HF. And then during, I look at RF, or sorry, uh, RMSSD and LF. And then after, I look at RMSSD and HF. So did I have a change during? And then is there a residual carryover effect? And the more and more I practice, the more and more this is a compounding effect that will happen. And again, the more and more I see this play out in an everyday scenario, and that's the key, right? Like, please keep this in mind. The key here is that how is this going to play out in the real world when things happen and you don't have yourself hooked up to a heart rate variability monitor? Things happen and you're not able to kind of like uh, take the time to kind of engage in the way that you might engage in a controlled condition scenario. That's where all kind of the work is put in. It's kind of like all the training that an athlete does like in the Olympics for sprinting. And what really matters is like when they get into the Olympic Games and they're on the starting line. And then the gun blows um, or the gun goes off. (laughs) The gun doesn't blow. The gun shoots. They probably don't even shoot guns anymore. I don't know if that's politically correct in the Olympics, but I I drone on. So, uh, Mark, great question. Hopefully that works. I mean, we could get into the kind of the different types of breath work protocols. But I think for now, a great starting place is to engage in biofeedback uh, for HRV. And then also too, just um, if you can find your resonant rate, find it like through a biofeedback clinician, which you can find at BCIA.org or, you know, hold on to your horses, hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. (laughs) Love to throw that in. All right. Thanks again, Mark. Next question comes from Jamie. I feel like I have a low HRV. People post their pictures of their readiness scores and mine is always substantially lower than them. Should I be concerned? And then what can I do about it? Uh, Let's see, about 75% of the emails that I have gotten um, over the course of having a consulting firm and then even here at Hanu Health and then on social media on Instagram or people who listen to me on Ben Greenfield Fitness, like people always ask this question about having a low HRV and doing a normative comparison to others and, you know, seeing me post my picture of, you know, my 150, you know, RMSSD or Ben Greenfield posting his of like his, you know, 150 or other people doing that and they get really concerned because they're like, mine is, you know, a 20 or mine is 30. Like, why is mine so low? And I think that can, in and of itself, it's going to lower your HRV because it's going to make you stressed and nervous that something's wrong. But I want to dispel that myth. And I already talked about this a little bit earlier, but I really want to take a deep dive. Right now, there is no research other than cardiac outcomes data that demonstrates a need for you to compare yourself to others. Let me repeat that. There's no research that we have right now other than looking at cardiac outcomes, especially post-myocardial infarction or heart attack, that demonstrates a need for you to compare yourself to anyone else. The king here is self-comparison, not normative data comparison. The only studies out there right now, if you look at them, are 24-hour recordings assessing SDNN as the biometric, looking at people who've had a heart attack, and then utilizing HRV 24-hour readings to determine the probability of compromised health that may lead to additional myocardial infarctions or heart attacks in the future. That's it. That's it. Now, there are some research looking at kind of like where elite athletes are in comparison to one another, but there has not been any research that will then demonstrate that these numbers of normative comparison make a difference in performance, they make a difference in recovery, and they make a difference uh, in overall stress resiliency. Because a baseline score is derived by so many variables. You may have insanely strong genetics 
from a cardiorespiratory system that increase the amount of variability. You may have low blood pressure or you may have bradycardia. Bradycardia or bradycardia is a uh, significantly low, comparatively, significantly low heart rate. Um, You may have a history of tachycardia, which is a significantly high heart rate, which will reduce heart rate variability. There are all these different variables that you really need to make sure that you are assessing for. I'm not even assessing. It's a very scientific way of putting it. But there are these things that you need to be looking out for because in the end, um, they may be kind of the key driver to the baseline of your HRV. So what? is the most important thing. Like why, what should we be worrying about? Like in terms of HRV? Well, it's not whether or not you have a quote unquote low or high HRV as a baseline. What you really should be concerned with is how much control you have over your nervous system. How much ability do you have when the crap hits the fan to access your vagus nerve and to control your response from a physiological mechanism? how much control. Now, how does that manifest itself objectively? It manifests itself objectively when you're engaging in HRV biofeedback. When you're taking continuous biofeedback uh, of your HRV biometric, you're trying to manipulate those numbers through breathing, through paced breathing. How well can you influence that data? Now, that's the purely objective means. What that should translate to is that the people that typically can modulate their HRV higher have better resiliency and fortitude to stress and report less stress and less anxiety. It's the individuals that cannot move the needle when they're engaging in biofeedback, at least initially, because all of us can train our ability to modulate HRV successfully. All of us. That's the great thing about how we've evolved. But it's those people who can't move the needle as much that will report a higher level of subjective stress. That's, again, regardless of baseline. It's how much can you modulate or move the needle. I put a a post on Instagram. You can, again, follow us, shameless plug, at hanuhealth.com. No, at Hanu Health for Instagram. I don't think there's dot coms or Instagram. So at Hanu Health. Uh, I posted a picture of an, an elite athlete that I worked with. And this elite athlete had, uh, like many elite athletes that I see, had a, had a really, really high HRV. I wanted to say he was, you know, above 100. It was, it was pretty high. And uh, when I, he, he reported, though, like, again, baseline high HRV reported, like, all of these symptoms of fatigue and overtraining and exhaustion and stress and anxiety and just kind of like a poor, uh, you know, uh, just overall poor health and gut issues. But he had a really high HRV. We did some biofeedback. And then the first session, he took his 100 score, um, like, up to, like, 102. And then after his session, it went back down immediately to 100. So going high baseline of 100 up to 102 to 100, just in case you're wondering, is not very impressive. Then I posted a side picture of another. This is a diagram that I put uh, of another guy who was quote unquote normal, not an elite athlete, just kind of an everyday guy um, who uh, had a lot of strong resiliency to stress, tons of energy, like was very just happy in life, but had what many people, if they looked at their data, might consider themselves as a quote unquote, and I'm going to use quote unquote a thousand times here, a low HRV. It was 20, 20 milliseconds RMS SD value, which a lot of people, again, if you're trying to compare yourself to elite athletes, athletes from a normative baseline comparison and you're saying I have a 20 they have you know a 150 like there must be a problem with me well listen to what this individual that could do with a baseline of 20 when they engaged in a 15 minute biofeedback session they raised their HRV from 20 to 50 it's a 30 point jump and then when they were done with the session it only lowered down to 40 so their baseline stayed higher for a period of time what does that indicate? Like, what does that mean? That means this person, again, with the quote unquote low HRV, had the ability and strength and control to modulate his nervous system at will, engage the vagal break at will. And not only did it significantly result in change in the acute kind of immediate transient phase, but it had what we call this carryover effect, this residual effect. And the more and more this individual practice, guess what happened? the more and more he had the ability to raise the amplitude of his HRV. Started going from a baseline of 20 up to 60 and then back down to you know 50 or 40. And then what happened over time? Well, the more and more this individual trained and trained and trained HRV, 
we started seeing that thermostat of baseline HRV creep up a little bit. It went from 20 to 25 to 30 to 35. Why does that happen? Well, our, our bodies and our nervous systems are extremely smart in the sense that when we train it and condition it to do something, then it determines, well, this is really good because objectively and subjectively, like it's better for you. Like you, you feel better, like you're, you're uh, more engaged. And so therefore, like if you're going to keep doing this, we might as well just go ahead and set the thermostat up for you. It's very similar to blood pressure. Like how do people cr- uh, get hypertension? Well, the thermostat ends up changing. Their blood pressure doesn't just go from, you know, let's say a, you know, 110 over 60 up to a 150 over 90, like overnight. That, that just doesn't happen unless they have, you know, a significant viral load or there there's something acute like that. But people who have, most people who have hypertension and primary hypertension, it's because of a compounding effect, right? I mean, mainly stress. I mean, we all kind of know that's a huge effect, but it's it, it's a compounding effect and the thermostat changes to where your baseline heart rate variability or your baseline blood pressure in that, you know, example stays up, goes up and stays up. So the same thing is here. So, you know, again, this, it's a great question, Jamie. I mean, I think in the end, like we're self comparison always, um, you know, there's really no such thing as, as a low HRV. I and mean, we could argue that kind of on some different ends. Uh, but for our sake, when we're looking at stress resiliency, again, your ability to modulate HRV is much more important than where your baseline is. So keep that in mind, but you can, you can change your thermostat by, uh, practicing and compounding that effect, even if it's starting at, let's say just a couple minutes a day and working yourself up to 10, 15 minutes. You know, they say the gold standard is, is in, in literature. And I always say, this is the ideal. We have to think of real and ideal. The ideal is HRV biofeedback two times a day for 20 minutes. That's 40 minutes of practice. And I know a lot of people either don't have that 40 minutes they can build in, um, or aren't willing to, I mean, it just seems like a lot. I mean, most people probably have it that they could build in. I mean, the average time people spend on social media is like three and a half, four hours nowadays. So yeah, you can build in 40 minutes of, of breath work or HRV biofeedback. Many people just choose to do other things for one reason or another. Great question, Jamie. All right. Last question comes from Paul. Paul asks outside of breath work, are there other ways to raise HRV? Okay. Great question. Uh, let's rephrase that question I want to, or reframe it at least. Um, so Paul says outside of breath work, are there other ways to raise HRV? So instead of H- other ways to raise HRV, I'm going to say outside of breath work, are there other ways to build resiliency and fortitude within the nervous system? Are there uh, other ways to build better adaptations of the nervous system and stress response? And the question or answer to that is Absolutely, Paul. Um, absolutely. Now, I am always, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan, and obviously, Patrick is a huge fan of breathwork as being kind of the low hanging fruit accessible to us at all times. Uh, but it's not the only means, it's not the only method. And I know that myself and Patrick both agree on that. Uh, there are many different ways of kind of moving the needle. But again, I want to reframe this and conceptualize it a little bit differently than the way you asked, Paul. It's not that you asked it in a wrong way. But let's just remember that we can utilize HRV as a means of measurement. It's a proxy of nervous system functioning. It's a proxy of your stress response. Uh, What we also need to do is marry that objective data with your subjective experience and remember conceptually and cognitively that when we see a rise in HRV, we want it to coincide with a rise or ability in in our strength and resiliency to handle stress when it inevitably comes around the corner. So let's talk about what is the research indicated uh, does help indeed, yes, raise HRV, but more importantly, what has been found to be kind of the best low hanging fruit for stress resiliency. So, <laughs> so what I will say is that every, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised with this first one. Uh, like it, it, this is just one that makes sense. Uh, but I hone in on this one because I think that out of all the research, it probably has the most significance in terms of uh, the body of research, um, kind of the you know, number of quality published studies uh, within this framework. Um, and that's movement and exercise. Movement and exercise, the number one key way of building stress resiliency. Now, I could spend probably 
I would say an entire podcast series uh, talking about the effects of exercise on HRV, the effects of exercise on uh, nervous system resiliency. Uh, but really, like it, it, this is the one that I think is just, again, low-hanging fruit. Now, there have been a multitude of studies that have examined the role of exercise on HRV. And what these studies have demonstrated is that sustained exercise can lead to enhanced vagal modulation. And with enhanced vagal modulation also comes something called enhanced baroreflex activity. Now, the baroreflex mechanism is a feedback loop mechanism, a negative feedback loop mechanism for maintaining homeostatic blood pressure, which is a fancy schmancy way of saying that our body has this regulatory system built in called the baroreflex mechanism that helps us to manage blood pressure. We know that there are two key contributors to vagal modulation and the raising of HRV. What are they? Number one I talked about earlier, which was respiratory sinus arrhythmia. That's changes of heart rate and variability across the respiratory cycle. So that's the inhale increase and that's the exhale decrease across the rec respiratory cycle. And then the other one is changes in the baroreflex activity or baroreflex mechanism. Again, this is just a way of maintaining uh, blood pressure uh, within the nervous system. And what happens is, is that we have these specialized pressure mechanisms or specialized pressure receptors that are located um, in the aortic arch and the um, carotid sinus that will detect changes both in heart rate and, and blood pressure and help to mediate or modulate, I should say, those effects um, through uh, different uh, neurochemical and neuromodulatory pathways, uh, but also, too, it changes um, the cardiac cycle. And so, again, I don't want to you know jump too deep into the baroreflex mechanism, but do know that a key way that exercise affects change is through enhancing sensitivity of the baroreflex mechanism so that it, respond, it responds to blood pressure changes more quickly and is indicative in the subjective data of changes, yes, in your blood pressure, but also changes in heart rate variability. So the more sensitive we make the barrel reflex mechanism to detect changes in activity, then we also enhance nervous system resiliency, and that will subsequently manifest itself in a raising of heart rate variability. So, you know, one of the things that we, I, I will mention too, <coughs> excuse me, with exercise, because a lot of people ask about, okay, so modality of exercise, like, should I be doing HIT? Should I be doing zone two? Should I be doing, you know, like long, you know, endurance training, resistance or weight training, um, you know, yoga, you know, Pilates, uh, and, you know, whatever it may be. And I would say that uh, the net net of this is that any form of exercise is going to help to enhance vagal modulation and baroreflex activity. We have enough published studies that demonstrate that to this date and please listen to this to this date no research has demonstrated the efficacy of one exercise modality over another but we do have evidence for both endurance training and high intensity interval training that can increase autonomic nervous system resiliency and activity as well as resistance training so all three of those hit training high intensity interval training endurance training as well as um, uh, uh, weight or resistance training affect change and increase our resiliency within the autonomic nervous system, which again manifests itself in raised HRV. Now, this is personal anecdote. I have found that the single-handed greatest way of me increasing HRV from an exercise perspective has been zone two training. Uh, if you're not familiar with zone two training, you can listen to the uh, podcast that Peter Atia did with Inigo San Milan, uh, which uh, demonstrates kind of scientifically how if we engage in more moderate level exercise or a low heart rate, what we call zone two heart rate exercise, that this can help us not move over into more of a anaerobic state, but keeps us in more of an aerobic state um, for the utilization of oxygen, which is better for mitochondrial uh, uh, repair and reduction of inflammation, which can also help to increase um, our ability to deliver uh, blood rich oxygen. Uh, sorry, yeah, blood rich um, and uh, oxygen rich, I should say, blood uh, throughout the nervous system and throughout the uh, central nervous system, and, and more particularly to the brain. So for me, I've been engaging in zone two training now for. I guess we're getting on close to a year um, after hearing um, in the, that podcast with Inigo San Milan, 
And I have seen significant, I'm talking about significant movement in HRV. Um, and it has been an absolute um, kind of mind blowing uh, uh, experience for me just because I am someone who does a lot for HRV, but I've found zone two to be quite effective. I've always done hit training. I've always done resistance training for as long as really I've been in the health and wellness scene and, uh, you know, got my, was, was doing my doctoral work in, in, in psychology and psychophysiology. And for me, uh, you know, again, those have been quite effective, but I kind of just got the icing on the cake with zone two training. Now, again, I will say that there's limited research um, saying that this is, you know, confounded or, you know, this is, uh, this is kind of the way to do it. I think that the research is conclusive that any type of exercise and movement, especially consistent exercise and movement is quite effective in increasing nervous system resiliency. I've just personally found zone two to be effective. Okay. Next one, uh, goes without saying, but again, I need to really hone in on it. Sleep. Um, there are many studies um, that have been published in blue ribbon journals that have indicated that if you are getting the appropriate amount of sleep and, and more import- importantly, good quality sleep, especially without adjuvants, <laughs> a lot of um, pharmacology that influences uh, sleep rhythm and sleep cycles and circadian, uh, that you will see an enhancement in heart rate variability. Well, think about it. Sleep is one of our primary means for recovery, and we know that HRV is a is a determinant of recovery of the nervous system. So when we overtrain with exercise or overreach with exercise, and our nervous system doesn't have enough time to recover in between, it will manifest in a lower HRV because our nervous system is not nearly as primed and has not been fully recovered. Well, sleep is one of the primary means of recovery. It's one of the primary means of energy reserve and conservation. When we sleep, the bulk majority of the share of time is, uh, is, is influenced by parasympathetic activity. Now, when we're engaged in REM sleep or dream sleep, actually we see an enhancement of sympathetic activity or the, uh, it would look, it looks kind of like a lowering of HRV and an increased heart rate. Uh, but again, very much needed for overall health and well-being to, to um, have REM sleep. However, during deep sleep um, and even light sleep, we see more parasympathetic activity than anything. Now, if we have a nervous system that is super overtrained, not recovered, not resilient, and a lot of stress load, anxiety, depression, mental health-related issues, that can manifest in a low HRV, and we can see that at, that at night. And if that impairs sleep, especially if you have a sleep disorder, um, like a sleep-wake disorder, order, insomnia, so forth, we see that these people have significantly lower levels of HRV and higher levels of subjective stress. So I don't want to hone in too much on this one, but appropriate sleep, making sure that the setting is conducive for health, both lighting, mood, making sure that it's cleanly, everything that Molly McLaughlin talked about you know, in the episode we did on sleep, all of these things are extremely important uh, and should not be overlooked. All right, the next one would be a low inflammatory diet. Now, I talked already about kind of increasing oxygenation throughout the body, and we can do that through breath work. We can do that through exercise. We all can. Well, we also can do that through lowering of inflammation. Um, if the epithelial walls of our cells are inflamed because we're eating a diet that's high in omega-6 fats, high in linoleic acid, high in sugars, what we see uh, is that the uh, the vasoconstriction of our blood vessels um, can significantly reduce heart rate variability and can significantly enhance our stress experience. And the reason being is because if we're not having that enhanced vasodilation response, then one of the problems is, is that we're not going to get good blood flow and good blood regulation and good delivery of oxygenation to all tissues, including the heart, including the lungs, and including the brain. So it is imperative. It is absolutely imperative that we're eating a low and inflammatory diet. That's a removal of many of the processed foods, rancid, nasty, inflammatory omega-6 fats. Uh, and then one that is really high in, in, in anti-inflammatory properties, high in omega-3s, um, high in uh, things like polyphenols, uh, high in our nitric oxide. I mean, that's a great podcast that I did with Dr. Nathan Bryan, premium an expert in nitric oxide. And again, I think that one of the things that I've noticed too, personally, and again, this is just anecdotal, 
we're looking at getting some research in this area. But one of the things that I've noticed is that as I have increased my nitrate um, load and increased endogenous nitrites, that I have seen that this enhanced NO level has increased significantly my HRV. And I'm not exaggerating. I've seen significant increase. So a low uh, low inflammatory diet or an anti-inflammatory diet is extremely important. Again, I could go off into a whole series on diet, but I think for the sake of time today, um, that's what I want to highlight. Next one would be meditation and gratitude. And meditation and breath work kind of go hand in hand with one another, but are not the same. I really love the practice of meditation and mindful awareness, and especially the practice of gratitude. It is something to not be overlooked, and there is so much compelling published research in the area of mindfulness, of meditation, of gratitude practice, whether it's as simple as gratitude, um, uh, journaling, or reaching out to somebody a week um, just to share your thankfulness and, and gratefulness for them. That love and connection that we experience through the meditation and gratitude practice will significantly increase our resiliency to stress um, because it is those types of experiences and relationships that we can form through meditation and gratitude um, that will uh, be kind of our go-tos instead of anger and heightened emotional experience. So I love meditation and gratitude. Next one would be experiencing a quality environment. So those and what we surround ourselves with can significantly enhance HRV and more so, uh, that's just the manifestation, increase our resiliency to stress. What does that actually look like? So uh, again, I am you know mentioned a lot of podcasts. We'll link these in the show notes. But uh, one of the podcasts um, that we did uh, was uh, what, I, what I did was Dr. Leah Lagos. I mentioned her earlier and you know she mentioned um, kind of one of the things that she has seen uh, is how if we surround ourselves with a quality environment that can then enhance uh, our nervous system resiliency, what does that actually look like? So what that actually looks like is um, placing ourselves in an environment that is nice and comfortable, one that has great lighting because we know that lighting effect on mood um, is so significant. Uh, We also know, too, that uh, one, that it smells good, maybe some essential oils, maybe some candles. Uh, One that is also free of clutter. I have a bad habit of this. I have a lot of stuff for, you know, podcasting and for video recording, whatever it may be. And so sometimes my office gets cluttered and I notice that when my office is cluttered, my HRV is lower and I also feel a lot just more stressed, more anxious. So making sure that you establish a good quality of life environment, both in your office, at work, or you know, in your car, or because we spend a lot of time in our car, um, you know, at home, especially within your room or your living room or your kitchen, that is a really important one. Uh, the last one would be quality relationships. Uh, and, I, and I say this one for last because I think it's probably arguably the most important one. Those who you surround yourself with, and COVID-19, unfortunately, has made this a little bit more difficult because we've been around an environment that is, uh, leads to social isolation, and social isolation leads to less resiliency of the nervous system. Love, affection, closeness to those that we um, are close to or that we love, um, love the ones we love, uh, is arguably the strongest way to build the most resiliency. And I have noticed, especially when I'm doing breath work and meditation and gratitude practices, that when I just bring the visual of those I love, or maybe I um, you know, recollect a experience that I had with one, like with, you know, snuggling with my boys or, you know, kind of being in the room and, and talking with my wife or all those experiences that I just really enjoy and cherish that I will see that aside from me um, engaging in any other practice, me just thinking about those things can truly affect my overall mood uh, and my HRV will rise. Yeah, so that's that, I think those are some good places to start, Paul. And, and again, I I call all of those basics. Those are my basics before biohacks. There's definitely ways that we can biohack the nervous system to increase resiliency and optimize. But again, that's when we have everything else in order. And again, I'm going to I'm going to continue to use that term basics before biohacks because it is absolutely something that um, if you avoid all of the basics or if, it, if you don't have those kind of in order and you try to biohack it, you're going to be very disappointed, not to mention you're going to also <laughs> spend a lot of money and a lot of time. So get the basics down first and then you can biohack and, and that's really the way to do it. 
All right. I think we've gone over an hour and I hope that within the context of me, you know, pro- providing an overview of HRV, answering these three questions again from Mark, Jamie and Paul, that I've given a lot of value to you and things that you can do for this day, this week, the next month, or maybe make it a habitual part of your own practice. Uh, we're going to obviously like be here to answer more questions. So submit them podcasts at hanuhealth.com. Make sure that you all go like and follow at Hanu Health on Instagram and post your questions there. We'd love to hear from you. And again, if I read your question on these HRV Q and A's, Mark, Jamie, Paul, send me an email podcast at hanuhealth.com name address. We'll send you over a gear package. And again, if you really want to support and help us out, like the best way to do it is twofold. Number one, go over to Apple podcasts and write us a five-star review. And again, if I read that review on the Q and a with Patrick and I, you're going to get a free Hanu Health gear package. You know, you want some myotape and some, you know, atomic focus signed atomic focus. And then of course, all the Hanu health gear can be a gearhead, just like all of us who work here at Hanu health. Uh, and then the other way is to join our wait list because <clears throat> if you're listening to this and we haven't already announced, we have just some amazing revolutionary technology that's coming out in the health and wellness space, but more specifically in the stress resiliency and adaptation space, a very unanswered space. So you're going to want to follow it because it's just unbelievable what we have around the corner. All right, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in, sticking with me to the very end. Uh, you know, we really do appreciate you. I'm very grateful for all of you who've decided to follow and listen. Um, again, we, uh, we, we just, I can't even begin to kind of like acknowledge how grateful I am for you guys. All right, everybody. I hope that you have a wonderful week. We'll be back more with these Q and a episodes. Hope that you enjoy them. Let us know, let us know in the, in the comment section on Instagram because you've followed us at Hanu health. And until then, hope you guys are really working to increase your self-awareness to stress, really increasing your self-regulation to stress, and just living the best possible life that you can with the, with the best people around you, those that you love and you cherish, and those who you feel affection from. All right, everybody, take care. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the Hanu Health Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. This podcast would not happen without listeners and supporters like you. And the best way to support us and the show is to head on over to iTunes and provide us with a five-star review. This helps us reach others and spread the good word of breathing and stress resiliency. If we read your five-star review on air, please reach out to podcast at hanuhealth.com with your name and mailing address, and we will send you some sweet Hanu gear. Until next time, breathe better and stress less.